Bank of the West is a longtime corporate partner of the Commonwealth Club, and we are proud to support this relevant and timely conversation today. Bank of the West is a leader in sustainable banking. We use our financial strength to promote and support equitable growth. Our $1 billion lending in the past three years to finance clean energy solutions have earned us the recognition from organizations, including the Conservation Alliance, Protect Our Winters, and 1% for the Planet. As the second largest agribusiness lender in the U.S., we offer specialization in production agriculture to meet the distinct challenges of this industry. We are supportive of climate positive policies and working on advancing sustainable farming and solutions. Thank you to the Commonwealth Club team for allowing us to sponsor this conversation. This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. How realistic is it to expect climate policy to be part of the next farm bill? We have done big and difficult things in this country, but it is difficult. And our current political state, I think you'd have to be blind to not just acknowledge that it's not getting any easier. Since the 1930s, the federal government has supported farmers with subsidies, credit, and crop insurance. But historically, Black, Indigenous, and other farmers of color have been excluded from those benefits. We got to find a way around that uh, circus and circle to really uh, put some real hard programs into effect so that farmers of color can uh, start receiving some benefits. Can we make progress on equity and climate now that we couldn't in the past? This can be win-win. We can be pro-climate, we can be pro-farmer, pro-farm income, and we weren't there 10 years ago. Digging deep into the next Farm Bill, up ahead on Climate One. Roughly every five years, the U.S. designs and implements a new Farm Bill, which sets federal policy on agriculture across a huge swath of programs, including subsidies, food assistance, land practices, and more. As a discussion around what to include in the 2023 Farm Bill intensifies, many are pushing for climate mitigation and adaptation measures to be the primary focus of the legislation. These measures would include support for more environmentally friendly practices like cover cropping, planting crops to cover the soil and not meant for harvesting, no-till farming to reduce carbon emissions, as well as agroforestry or planting trees near crops to help boost yields and sequester carbon. In February of this year, USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack announced a billion dollars in funding for climate smart agriculture pilot projects that claim to reduce emissions and sequester carbon. Today, we're exploring what the Farm Bill can do to further incentivize carbon management practices while helping farmers and ranchers adapt to the increasingly disruptive impacts of climate change. This episode is supported in part by Bank of the West. Jonathan Coppice is an assistant professor at the University of Illinois and a Farm Bill historian. Climate One's Ariana Brocious asked him where he sees the clearest avenues for incorporating more climate policy into the next Farm Bill. It is a very uh, complex and, and certainly an omnibus uh, legislative vehicle. I think when we think about bringing in climate change into federal agricultural policy, probably the first and, and, and most direct route is through what, what we call the conservation programs. So these are a series of, of, of different types of assistance that we make directly to the farmer to do things like uh, conserve natural resources, you know, to protect uh, against soil erosion or improve water quality, uh, maybe reduce the amount of water they use in irrigation systems all the way up to things that might uh, help protect habitat and and um, some of the wildlife benefits that we might see out of, say, uh, retiring acreage for a set of time or rebuilding a wetland or things like that. So within those conservation programs, as you mentioned, there's a lot of them. And even farmers who take advantage of these, it might be a pretty small percentage of their overall acreage that's actually enrolled. How much room is there to grow them or put more money in them or encourage, you know, uh, more farmers to actually take advantage of them. The tough reality with conservation programs is that they are oversubscribed. So they could they have pretty vast reach. I mean, there's no sort of um, regional or statewide or crop based limits on this. I mean, any farmer or any farm landowner can conceivably enroll in a conservation program. Different ones have different priorities or things they try to accomplish, like um, you know, the difference between, say, a wetlands program that tries to restore wetlands and 
uh, something like the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, which pays farmers a, a cost to share to sort of offset the cost of, say, putting in uh, a grass waterway or if it's a livestock operation to to address, uh, you know, handling the manure and, and, and storage and sort of cleaning up things like that. So they can apply very broadly. I think our biggest problem is funding. In fact, uh, the biggest challenge for a farm bill debate will be the politics around the budget and the and the fact that these are uh, kind of stuck, if you will, into a, into kind of a fit box or fixed box of funding. So there's not a lot of additional money to move out. And so if you're going to increase demand or increase usage of those dollars, we're just spreading the same amount of dollars over over more and more efforts. And in that case, more acres and more farmers. So if we were trying to encourage something that we know has climate benefits like no-till agriculture, um, where you're helping not release carbon emissions, is it just about getting more funding to kind of go with the existing programs and really make those more widespread? In the conservation title, yes. I mean, most of that's going to be around how do we expand the funding for, you know, pick your acronym, pick your program and try to and try to get more acres, more farmers enrolled. But to do that, you need more money. When we think about getting climate change or practices that help address climate change, so things that may um, capture greenhouse gas emissions and kind of hold them in the soil. To do that, we need to be on the massive land acreage footprint that is in production now. So we're talking somewhere between 340 to 350 million acres that are used every year to produce crops. The more traditional conservation programs aren't going to hit that kind of acreage. We're going to need something that goes in and says, uh, let's help farmers, you know, combine things like no-till and cover crops and nutrient management so the fertilizers are not contributing to both water quality challenges, but also climate change. And so then we're talking about a much larger acreage footprint, and we start looking elsewhere in the farm bill for a way, um, particularly thinking about creative ways in which we can we can blend some of the other programmatic assistance to farmers with uh, climate change goals or outcomes. So another major avenue for climate policies within the farm bill would be subsidies or crop insurance programs, right? Can you give us a sense how Climate disruption is already impacting yields and thus some of those programs. Where we're going to see climate change really raise the most concerns could be around the crop insurance program, because we are trying to run an insurance program that covers losses. And as, as climate change drives more and more losses, you know, one of the things we like to talk about with crop insurance, the reason why it's so challenging and the reason why we have a lot of federal involvement and frankly, federal dollars going in to subsidize and help the program is we all, you know, we all have some familiarity with insurance, you know, car insurance, but nobody, you know, it isn't the situation where, you know, an entire region wrecks its car at the same time. You have a drought or you have a widespread pre prevented plant scenario in the spring, you know, you could wipe out an entire region. 2012, for example, we took a massive hit uh, because of a drought in the Midwest in the crop insurance program. So to be able to sort of run that kind of actuarial science and, and all the rating and, and the issues they use to try to make an, an insurance policy and program work it is drastically complicated by that, you know, not un, uh, unusual or, or out of the complete ordinary kind of massive event, um, a water shortage in the West, those sorts of things. And so people that are looking forward and, and trying to sort of put these pieces together are very concerned about what climate change may mean around the crop insurance program because of the way it's designed now and because of the implications we see for a variety of production challenges. Right. And part of that is because we are growing so many acres of the same crops, right? Where a lot of this is monocropping. We have, you know, millions of acres of corn and soy and, and wheat and rice and other things like that. So what's the argument then for maybe as a way to reduce the liabilities among crop insurance and losing a given crop in, you know, with increased climate disruption and uncertainty, further diversifying farms then. So you're not putting all of your, you know, your yield for a given year in one crop. That's a tough question. I mean, part of it is we have, we've developed this way over decades. This is not a, you know, we're not going to turn this sort of thing around very quickly. And we've consolidated farming, and so your operations are 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 bigger, and um, you know that sort of diversification cuts against all the push that we've seen for decades to try to get better, you know, efficiencies and economies of scale and those sort of you know things that the economists love to talk about. 
but that ultimately do sort of lead us down into this path. And then you've got, you know, again, layered on top of that, not just the farmer, but the way the whole system sets up. Um, so you will hear time and again, farmers who do try to diversify by maybe adding a crop. So let's add weed into our corn and soy rotation. Well, I've got no elevator to sell it to. I can't get a good price for it. There's no market, you know, sitting in central Illinois, maybe for that kind of diversification. So there's no, there's no easy way to sort of unravel or unwind those things and, and, and look towards diversification. Again, one of the examples tying back into climate change are some of the conservation practices that do promote diversity. So resource conserving crop rotations where we try to work in a different third or fourth crop. Cover cropping, which is a conservation practice where we would go in, if you take your typical corn and soybean operation, you go in, you know, harvest the corn or soybeans in the fall, and then you'll plant an overwinter crop because normally they're going to leave that field bare or fallow over the winter and into the spring. And now you're doing things that hold soil, keep nutrients from leaching into, into riverway, rivers and waterways, and a growing green crop will pull down carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So it begins to help capture that. So that would be one way to diversify in conservation that isn't just going from two commercial crops to three or four. And that could be a step along that process. So let's step back and take a look at the bill kind of, you know, as this large kind of behemoth puzzle that has a lot of moving parts. Where have we seen past successes in uh, introducing new component pieces to the farm bill or, you know, new programs, things that do actually change kind of how the money's spent? Probably the best historical example for what you just asked is the 1985 Food Security Act. And that was landmark legislation. And it's fascinating when you look at the history because the 85 Act came in in the middle of it or the depths of the 1980s farm economic crisis. So we had a lot of farmers going out, going bankrupt and uh, the, the markets had struggled and it was just, it was a mess. They had high inflation, they had high interest rates and just, just a series of economic challenges. At the same time in the 70s, we'd also vastly expanded production. And, and what we're talking about then is expanding acres where erosion is a problem or they're less productive or there's other challenges to that. So by the 80s, we've got not only a farm crisis, we've got an erosion crisis. We've got, you know, soils moving into waterways with pesticides and, and fertilizers in them and things like that. So this 85 Act is a massive change because we recreate what we call the Conservation Reserve Program. Uh, and that was about 45 million acres was the goal to take land out of production for up to 10 years. So, or 10, 15 years, actually, either, you know, depending on the, the practice you put on it. So the Conservation Reserve Program was designed in 85 to really let's, let's pull back those acres that shouldn't be in production because they have some environmental sensitivity. The other big one is in 1985, we added what we call conservation compliance to the farm subsidy programs. And this is key if you think about the politics and the economic situation. So farmers are in the depths of a crisis. And at that time, because the erosion problem was so significant, Congress attached conservation compliance. So basically telling a farmer, if you did not comply with the way you're supposed to treat highly erodible ground, for example, so it doesn't erode, you'll lose your farm subsidy payments. Or if you drain a wetland to farm it, you'll lose your farm payments. That's a pretty big move. Now, we can argue about, you know, how effective it is and so forth. But in terms of the politics of getting massive change, not only was it a big political step, it doesn't cost any money. It doesn't have a hit in the budget because it's not creating new program payments. It's just adding requirements onto the payments that, that, would, have, that would have been triggered anyway. Um, and so I think that's kind of an example where you can think about blending some outcomes. Farm subsidy payments in particular are, you know, taxpayer funded direct assistance producers. Are there arguments around that, that there should be something coming back in, some benefit to the general public who's helping to fund the programs to say, look, we want to see better climate resiliency or practices that are taken to help. You know, let's, let's look at that acre as more than just uh, the crop you're producing, but the crop you're producing and ecosystem services it can provide on top of it the water quality improvements, the habitat improvements, or pulling down carbon, pulling down greenhouse gases and, and, and storing in the soil for a stretch of time. I think that's a great example. And I'm wondering what you see from sort of a political standpoint as to the will 
to do more of that in this next round? Who's pushing for adding more compliance, more requirements, you know, bolstering some of the programs we've talked about? What are the sort of political factions that you see playing out? See, now you're now you ask me the very tough question. <laughs> Because the politics are are very difficult around this. You do not see a lot of farm groups or interests, you know, um, wanting to expand conservation compliance or take it in a new direction. Because, of course, it's going to impact um, or p- could potentially impact their, their, uh, their assistance. It certainly gets even more controversial if you try to apply it to crop insurance. I don't want to leave any impression that, like, this is an easy thing to achieve. It is a straightforward, relatively, you know, simple kind of policy concept, but it, the politics are difficult because we're impacting so many producers and, and, and you know, potentially large amounts of funding. I, I don't want to ever sound like a pessimist because we have done big and difficult things in this country and, in, in our, and Congress has found ways to do big and difficult policy achievements, but it is difficult. And our current political state, I think you'd have to be uh, blind to not just acknowledge that it's not getting any easier. And in fact, we are pretty actively, you know, making it more difficult, if not kind of tearing apart some of the the political muscles, the the the, the things that we need to exercise and use, like negotiation and compromise, like deliberation and debate. We've done a lot more damage to those uh, in recent times, and we've improve them. And and things like a farm bill, as you've mentioned, you know, is complex and many moving pieces and parts and big, you know, federal budget numbers and things like that requires an awful lot of deliberation, good faith negotiation, and ultimately compromise. And we just, uh, we've not seen much of that lately. Jonathan Coppice is an assistant professor at the University of Illinois. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us on Climate One. Ariana, thanks for having me. It's great to talk to you. You're listening to a conversation about the climate implications of the Farm Bill. Coming up, how do subsidies in the Farm Bill actually affect farmers? Everyone agrees that we we need a farm safety net. We need to, we need ways to help farmers weather the ups and downs of agriculture, especially now that extreme weather is impacting farmers' livelihoods. And, and I, I think also it's the case that most farmers agree that there ought to be reasonable limits on, on who receives those payments. That's up next when Climate One continues. Scott Faber is Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at the Environmental Working Group. And Chuck Connor is President and CEO of the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives. Ten years ago, Connor said that he couldn't talk about climate with his member farmers. I asked him what those conversations are like today. I think, um, Greg, many, and I would go as far as to say most in American agriculture today, uh, when this issue came up in the 2009, 2010 period, there was there was great fear among farmers. There was just a thought that climate uh, debate and and climate, uh, if you will, friendly policies just simply meant somebody was going to be standing there looking over their farmer's shoulders, telling them how to farm, and and you know sort of a, a micromanaged kind of situation. And I think over time we have shown them that uh, that is not the case. That this is about uh, providing the right information to them. Uh, This is about providing, you know, um, efficiency options. This is about doing it, you know, the best that you possibly can, but all in a manner that gives them complete and total control over their land and their farming operations. And and they're supportive of that. And they're they're growing uh, stronger every day. And I think there's a sentiment out there that this can be win-win. We can be pro-climate. We can be pro-farmer, pro-farm income. And we weren't there 10 years ago. Scott, the Environmental Working Group keeps a database of farm subsidies and crop insurance payments. What has your data shown on who gets those payments? Most of those dollars have gone to complex farming operations and households. Tell us where the money goes. Yeah, I think everyone agrees that we we need a farm safety net. We need to we need ways to help farmers weather the ups and downs of agriculture, especially now that extreme weather 
is impacting farmers' livelihoods. And and I, I think also it's the case that most farmers agree that there ought to be reasonable limits on on who receives those payments and how much they receive. Um, you know, if you're very, very successful, you you probably reach a point where you no longer need the government support. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have meaningful limits on our subsidies. Um, there have been efforts uh, to place a real means test in place. Um, Chuck led some of those efforts when when he worked for the Department of Agriculture. And the result of those loopholes, if you will, is that some very, very large operators are getting millions of dollars every year. I don't think anyone probably, except perhaps the family members and friends of those operators, think that makes much sense. There's probably consensus between environmental groups and taxpayer groups and farm groups that um, we need a safety net. It needs to really be a strong safety net, uh, but we also need to have reasonable limits on who can get subsidies because they're so successful. And, and then the amounts that they get that uh, it, I can't imagine any situation where any individual should get a millions and millions of dollars from the taxpayer. That just doesn't make much sense. Chuck, if the farm bill is written with the notion that we produce too much and need to keep the brakes on, help me understand the role of subsidies. Are we paying farmers to not produce crops, livestock, or dairy, and why? Well, this has been a, a paradigm of farm policy, uh, Greg, since the 1930s, where we were really began to make you know, some large crop subsidies uh, during the Great Depression. And... Uh, you know, I think you could, you know, make an argument in that uh, during those early years of, you know, paying at a time that you were trying to get less production, there, there could be some conflicts there. And, and for many years, we had to have government sponsored set asides just sort of keep that check and balance. Having said that, you know, we're, we're not paying a tremendous amount in farm subsidies right now, Greg. And that's a mis, you know, mischaracterization by some out there, um, you know, compared to the farm bills that I worked on for the Senate Ag Committee in the 1980s, we're paying really a lot less in farm subsidies. So I don't see those subsidies having the market impact like they did, you know, 15, 20, 30 years ago. Scott, your colleague Ann Scheckinger found that between 2001 and 2020, farmers received $1.5 billion in crop insurance payments for planting crops in flood-prone parts of the Mississippi River Basin. Her analysis argued that money could have been spent to retire or restore lands for carbon sequestration benefit instead. Are we spending taxpayer money in the best way in the flood-prone areas of the Mississippi? Yeah, well, and, and let me let me reiterate that we need a, a strong farm safety net. That includes helping farmers obtain crop insurance so they can manage their risks. But there are some important lessons to be learned from the flood insurance program that that property owners participate in that ought to be applied to the crop insurance program, and especially where you have folks who are getting repeatedly flooded, who have or are farming very wet grounds, and and because of their repeat uh, indemnities from the crop insurance program are are increasing the cost of crop insurance for everyone else. So there there are probably some opportunities to adjust rates to send the right market signals to folks who are farming places that they might not otherwise farm without the, the government subsidized crop insurance subsidy. There are also some opportunities to probably make better use of the conservation reserve program, um, the land retirement program that's been around for many decades, so that we're better targeting those acres at those frequently flooded floodplain lands, partly to avoid those government payments, right? You know, if those are lands that are hard to farm, they're they're frequently flooded, marginal lands. Um, let's use our, our CRP dollars, our land retirement dollars, to try to offer those farmers an easement, uh, in part to, again, avoid the, the taxpayer cost, but also to get uh, all the environmental benefits, especially the long-term st uh, storage of carbon in the soil and the wildlife benefits, the water quality benefits that would come from, from restoring some of those lands. Chuck, your thoughts on reforming that? We all know that the National Flood Insurance Program is broken. Congress has tried and failed to fix it. How about uh, climate resilience in terms of crop insurance? Well, um, crop insurance is a complicated issue, Greg. Um, I'm not discounting um, any of Scott's points, you know, on their face. I think these are always things that we need to look at. There's been an, a number of attempts in the past to, you know, to reflect, to have rates reflect, you know, that risk on, on that, you know, in that particular region, in that floodplain, so that 
you know, a, a farmer in McLean County, Illinois, sort of the prime farmland of the United States is not, you know, paying the same insurance for his operation as someone who's, um, you know, farming in the, the, the Wabash River uh, floodplain sort of thing. And I, I think we've achieved some of that. You know, would I stand up here and absolutely pound and say, you know, we're there? No, I, I wouldn't do that at all. Uh, and not even close. But I, I do appreciate Scott's comments on the CRP, uh, Conservation Reserve Program. I do hope that down the road, CRP continues to be a vehicle whereby we, we can farm as, you know, as is described, the, the most valuable land and where land is highly sensitive, be able to use programs like the CRP to, to take that land out of production. Chuck, your group is part of the Food and Agriculture Climate Alliance, which has expressed support for climate smart policies under the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which are voluntary, incentive based and focused on commodity crops. Um, Learning from other sectors where industry, of course, prefers voluntary uh, measures first, and those only go so far. What do you expect from those policies can accomplish voluntary incentive based? I, 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 I think they can fully accomplish our objectives here, Greg, and I, I don't in any way accept that this is a precursor to something uh, mandatory coming down the pike. Uh, I believe we can uh, achieve those objectives. Uh, we've, we've done it in the past in agriculture. You know, we, we had the uh, uh, recollect back to the Dust Bowl years and all the problems we had with soil erosion. You know, through voluntary uh, incentive-based programs, through technical assistance from uh, uh, soil specialists, you know, we, we have curbed a great deal, I would say, almost all of those kinds of conservation problems. I see no reason to believe that we can't stem this uh, problem with uh, climate change and the problems that we have out there using this same model. Scott, the, the two biggest sectors of emissions in the U.S. are the utilities, electricity, buildings, and, and transportation mobility. Those industries have also said, well, we got this, voluntary, incremental, comfortable, we'll, we'll get there without re government regulation. That didn't really prove, to ca prove the case. Is it the case in agriculture that voluntary, incremental will get us to our climate goals? Well, there, there's no question that farmers can take steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and many are already doing so. The, the real tragedy of our policy right now is that two out of three farmers who go to USDA and ask to, with their own money, bringing their own money to the table and ask the government to help share the cost of practices to use uh, their nitrogen fertilizer differently or change how they're using nitrogen fertilizer or change how they're feeding their animals or how they're storing animal waste. Two out of three farmers who, who ask for government assistance are being turned away because of our misplaced spending priorities. That is ridiculous. And I think every American from, from a, across the political spectrum uh, would agree that it should be a big priority for the government to share the costs of those practices. They're not free. They're not free to the farmer and, and they work. And, you know, I'll just, I think, to their credit, Chuck's organization joined with groups like EWG to support a big increase in, in the spending for these climate smart practices in the Build Back Better bill that has passed the House and is still pending in the Senate. But we need to make better use of the $6 billion a year we already are giving farmers. We have right now that USDA is giving farmers too little of that money is going to practices that reduce emissions. And too much of it is going to practices that either don't do much to reduce emissions or in some cases even increase emissions. So so we need to, I think, while, while Secretary Vilsack and his team has done a lot to make climate smart practices a priority, um, and we need more money as, as has been proposed in Build Back Better, we need to make much better use of the money that Congress has already provided in the last farm bill. Chuck, some of the biggest optimists I talk to across the climate spectrum are people who are interested in soil regeneration. Uh, soil can capture water, carbon, all sorts of things. Uh, it's tough to scale, but that's pretty upsetting to hear Scott say that farmers are going asking for climate smart help and they're not getting it from the federal government. What's, what's broken? What's wrong? Well, Greg, we've got too few resources. Uh, I, think, I think Scott laid out the problem and I, what he just answered, I, I wholeheartedly agree with it. Um, I would like to see us uh, you know, not only rework some of our existing programs in the farm bill to really give them a climate focus, 
But obviously we also, you know, part of the reason so many people were being turned away is just, you know, not enough resources. Well, let's talk about the political and economic context for that. We've seen some really big legislation, really trillion dollars used to be a lot of money in Washington. Now we've seen several uh, trillion dollar bills go through for COVID. What's, are the, what's the political and economic landscape right now for a more ambitious uh, farm bill? What do, you, what do you see in there, Scott? Well, you know, there, I think probably as, as all of us are talking and your, your listeners are, are uh, listening in, Senator Manchin and other senators are, 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 are meeting to discuss the energy package that uh, would be the, sort of a, a alternative, if you will, to the Build Back Better bill that has passed the House. Um, Congress still has five months. They have plenty of time to pass a Build Back Better package or some version of it that includes the $27 billion that the House approved and that Senator Stabenow has so effectively championed in the Senate for these climate smart practices. So um, it, that would be an enormous missed opportunity if we uh, left $27 billion in funding to help farmers reduce greenhouse gas emissions on, on the table. What what a waste that would be. And, and I think there's not just a really powerful, uh, you know, environmental case, right? We, we know that spending $27 billion on uh, better use of fertilizer, better use of changing what we feed animals, changing how we manage manure, we know those things will reduce nitrous oxide emissions and methane emissions. Um, there's also a really strong business case for making these investments. And, 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 and that's because right now, U.S. agriculture accounts for at least 10% of U.S. emissions. But every other sector, mostly because of policies we've adopted like renewable portfolio standards and CAFE standards, every other sector of the economy is taking steps to reduce their emissions, um, except for, unfortunately, our farmers. The emissions, when you look at the EPA's greenhouse gas inventory over time, those emissions are going up. And that's uh, no fault of the farmer. It's simply because we are eating more and more meat. We are producing more and more eat for a growing population around the globe. And when you fertilize animal feed and when you raise animals, you're going to increase nitrous oxide and methane emissions. So, so I, I think there's a there's not just an, a really obvious environmental case for helping to share the cost of these practices. I think there's a, a, a real reputational risk to our farmers if if we don't help every way we can. Uh, and use every tool in the toolbox to, to reduce emissions soon. But, you know, consumers have a big role to play here, too. And again, you know, if we double animal protein pro uh, production and consumption, there's no way we're going to meet the goals that we've set for ourselves for the climate. We've got to make it easier for consumers to occasionally, just once in a while, the 94% of us like me who eat meat, I had bacon and eggs for breakfast, the 94% of us who eat meat to occasionally try uh, and replace an animal protein with a plant-based protein to get a, get a little bit more of our protein from plants. And that's not just good for our, our health, our personal health, our cardiovascular health. It's not just good for the planet because it would help reduce many of the emissions we've talked about, the emissions from fertilizing animal feed and the emissions from the animals themselves. It's also really good for farmers because it turns out that the companies that turn plants into plant-based foods here in America are number one in the world. We are the best in the world at producing plant-based foods. Uh, there are already 55,000 jobs across the country, mostly in rural places, producing plant-based foods. That's a great opportunity for our farmers. And it's one we will lose if we aren't smart. Because other countries, especially China, no surprise, are making huge bets because they see what we're talking about. We need to make some bets in the next farm bill. Chuck, you say the farm bill is about leveling the playing field. Does addressing systemic racism have a place in the farm bill? I think so. Absolutely, Greg. I think we need to make sure that every uh, farm program that we reauthorize in the farm bill, every new program we put in place, whether that's climate related or anything else, there has to be a key element of that of, of, of serving the interest of uh, farmers of color. Um, you know, I, I would, uh, having served, uh, you know, a stint at the Department of Agriculture, um, you know, th this is not an idle problem. It's been a problem. It's, and, and, it, and it preceded Secretary Vilsack. I, I will tell you as well, I, I, I think Tom Vilsack is, is working very, very hard 
to try and uh, reverse, you know, some of these uh, patterns at USDA that, that have roots going back decades and decades. Thank you, Chuck and Scott. Thank you, Greg. Enjoyed it. You're listening to a conversation about the upcoming Farm Bill. This is Climate One. Coming up, historically, Black farmers have been excluded from the benefits of the Farm Bill and face discrimination from the USDA. Many Blacks weren't even given a, a loan application, you know? I was given one. Mine was tossed in the trash can and all kinds of stuff that, uh, that I personally faced. But the further I went south, the more egregious and more blatant the discrimination uh, was for, for Black farmers. That's up next when Climate One continues. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is tasked with implementing the programs in the Farm Bill. Historically, the USDA has denied loans and subsidies for non-white farmers. I asked John Boyd, president of the National Black Farmers Association, to share his story. Well, my personal experience uh, experience with the USDA as far as it relates to discrimination uh, goes back 39 years ago uh, to 1983, a very, very long time. My dad and grandfather was uh, totally against going to USDA and, and doing business with the government. And they always thought that uh, the government and black farmers didn't didn't go together, just never mixed. And maybe I should have listened to them, you know, <laughs> they're a lot older than I was. But uh, that was that's how I got introduced to it. And it was uh, uh, a spiral downhill, so to speak, as far as how uh, they treated uh, black farmers. Uh, this uh, lender would only see black farmers on on Wednesday one day of the week so we would all be in the hallway uh, i knew these older black farmers in the community where they were leaders they were deacons and uh, a couple even held uh, local positions in, in the county but uh, this person uh, didn't waive the discrimination for any of that uh, he talked low low to them uh, as far as bold and downward uh, called them boy and, and uh, negro uh, all, all sorts of uh, racial slurs is, is how it began. And then uh, trying to get a farm operating loan uh, was uh, just an uphill battle. This person uh, spat on me uh, during the, a loan exchange uh, called, uh, like I said, racial uh, epithets, tore my application up and to- tossed it in the trash can. And when I was finally able to get someone to look into it, they, they asked them, uh, did you have any problems? Uh, do you have any problems making loans to black farmers? And he said, well, yes, I think they're lazy and look for a paycheck on Friday, but it doesn't have anything to do with me doing my job. And uh, this person, uh, after he was found guilty of discriminating against me and many others in Mecklenburg County, Virginia, he was still allowed to keep his job and I moved to another county where he was allowed to retire. And that's the whole thing with discrimination in USDA. No one was ever uh, penalized or held accountable for the act of discrimination, although we had two federal lawsuits, uh, one in 1999 and the other on uh, December 8th, 2010. Uh, Then former President Barack Obama signed the Claims Remedy Act of 2010 into law. So we had two settlements, but nobody was ever fired. No senior person at USDA or or no local person, for for that matter, was ever fired for the act of discrimination. And as I organized further, I went south, Mississippi, Alabama, and Arkansas, Tennessee, Louisiana. The discrimination was more pervasive and uh, and, 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 and subtle, where many Blacks weren't even given a, a loan application, you know? I was given one. Mine was tossed in the trash can and all kinds of stuff that uh, that I personally faced. But the further I went south, the more egregious and more blatant the discrimination uh, was for for black farmers. You mentioned a couple of those uh, settlements, the 1999 settlement in Pigford versus USDA. That was an agreement of about a billion dollars uh, with government agreed to pay black farmers. Have black farmers received what they're owed under those that settlement and the other one you mentioned? Yes, but it took too long. And, uh, you know, it, it took me 30 years on that, on that, on that complaint. Uh, there was a few bills as well that went along with those settlements. Uh, we have 
Uh, all of the clans were too old, including mine. Uh, when I first started suing the government, my two years of statute of limitation had expired. So I had to go to Congress and get that lifted, got that passed that allowed all of the cases to go back to 1981 uh, to have their cases heard. So any black farmer that filed a case between 1981 and 1997 would, would, would be able to participate in the first lawsuit. USDA won on the motion that they didn't have to uh, notify any black farmer about the class action. So therefore, uh, 83,000 black farm families came after the filing deadline. Uh, the judge wouldn't allow them to be a part of the case. So I went back to Congress again uh, to have that uh, measure uh, included uh, in a bill that with the help of uh, Chuck Grassley and uh, uh, George Allen, uh, some some Republicans I had in there. And the leader at that time was uh, Ted Kennedy, and I think he became ill. Then Senator Barack Obama and Senator Biden, believe it or not, were the lead sponsors of that bill, and they both went on to become president. And I didn't know that was going to happen, but uh, that's how that that bill came about. The bill only let them have the uh, those eighty three thousand black farmers uh, cases heard based on merit. It didn't provide any compensation, so I had to go back to Congress again to get the settlement uh, funded uh, for one point two five billion dollars. And those cases were, were finally heard and, and adjudicated. Well, President Biden has uh, directed $4 billion in COVID relief funds toward Black, Indigenous, and other farmers of color. Is that money making a difference? And is the USDA you know, um, acting more appropriately, responsibly this time around? Well, there's a, there's a few things that I would like to address there. One is... Uh, I urged uh, then uh, Vice President Biden in South Carolina that we desperately needed a new face at USDA uh, to take on the bureaucracy at, at USDA. But instead, we, we got uh, uh, Secretary Vilsack uh, for a, a third term. Uh, I did express to uh, then President-elect that I thought that uh, Secretary Vilsack was the wrong man for this time in history. And uh, he pressed for us to support him. And if things didn't work out, to let him know. I don't think that things are working out. The bill that provided uh, $5 billion, $1 billion for technical assistance and outreach and set up all these other things at USDA, and then $4 billion for debt relief in the form of guaranteed loans and direct loans. Uh, so 14,000 uh, plus farmers of color were eligible to proceed there. There was no entity involved. It was a government to government transaction. So why did it take so long? There was no need to hold listening sessions when you already knew who these persons who were eligible, the farmers of color, uh, to receive the debt relief. So why not do it the same way you do subsidies for primarily large scale white farmers? When a president signs it, it's in the uh, checking accounts of those large scale and corporate farmers within weeks of it passing. Uh, so it took almost a year. And then uh, white farmers started suing us for reverse discrimination and uh, 12 different complaints in federal court and the National Black Farmers Association and the Association of American Indian Farmers uh, really started uh, uh, fighting back in, in those federal courts. Uh, two of the courts, Texas, and uh, Florida issued a temporary injunction blocking the aid to uh, our needy uh, farmers of color. So right now I'm in federal court in 12 different states, 12 different complaints in uh, various states. Now the white farmers were very crafty at this. I hate to use this term. They picked uh, very conservative judges, very conservative courts that they thought would look favorably upon what they were saying that it was reverse discrimination, some new loan program that excluded whites. But they never said they were the ones, they being white male farmers, that were getting the debt relief. The whole 30 years I was asking for it, it was those farmers who were actually getting the debt relief. Uh, that's why I was trying to get it, because Black farmers weren't. We were getting 30-day loan acceleration uh, letters, which means they were foreclosing on us. 
and white farmers were provided with other options under 1951S, which is the loan servicing arm for agriculture in this country at USDA. They were getting loan reamortizations, debt write down, uh, complete debts written off, and they were getting these options with ease. And black farmers, uh, if we weren't able to hustle up what we owed the government, those were the, that were lucky enough to get loans, within 30 days, we lost our farms. Well, that's, yeah, quite a tale. Thank you for sharing that. You know, are, are there measures in the farm bill to address these inequities? I'm glad you brought up the farm bill because it's something that uh, I would like to see a lot of changes in how they address uh, black and other farmers of color. In some of the bills that recently passed, it gives the uh, Secretary of Agriculture full discretion to implement. I would like to see that changed. Instead of giving the secretary, whoever that secretary is, full discretion to implement, give them time ramifications in which to complete the task. For instance, if there was a timetable for debt relief, this should be executed within 30, 60, and 90 days. We wouldn't be in, probably wouldn't be in the boat that we're in. And the programs that are targeted for farmers of color, uh, we always have to have matching funds from some outside organization to participate in those federal programs. I, I would like to see those measures taken out of the uh, farm bill. And what's happened to us historically is we don't receive uh, the happy checks from uh, corporate America and the others who manage these retirement funds that quickly help other causes have been slow to uh, help the National Black Farmers Association. And if they do, it's very, very small um, our monetary contributions, uh, not to say uh, as the president that we're not appreciative of that. Uh, so I don't want anyone to listen to this. And so, oh my God, these people don't appreciate the help. We appreciate the help at any amount. But for us to really save a farm at for, foreclosure, the average size of a, a loan, a, a mortgage, farm mortgage is $300,000. Somebody has to be able to write that in order to save that farm and get that farmer a, a second him or her a second chance. And we need the form of more direct assistance for farmers, such as infrastructure and equipment to facilitate any outside contract. And, and that's something Congress continues to turn a deaf ear to. Uh, so they would give uh, 40 million uh, to food hubs and, and food banks and 100 million to food banks, but they won't invest in the actual farmer himself. That is the person growing the food. Well, you mentioned land loss. You know, black-run farms were about 14% of the total in the U.S. in 1920, and today down to around 2%. Small and medium-sized farms have a harder time getting access to capital and technical support. Can you explain the challenges that present to new farmers and farmers of color? That's what we've been finding right there. The government needs to invest heavily and new and beginning farmers. And if we don't, I'm telling you right now, there's not only will black farmers be facing extinction, but all farmers in this country will be facing extinction if we don't invest in the next generation of farmers. And do you see change at USDA now? You talked about the impunity, uh, and particularly in local offices. Uh, do you see change now? Not on the local level. And that's mm -hmm. where the changes have to, have mm -hmm. to happen. And uh, I'm going to try to explain this quickly for a, a 101 for people who don't understand how the government works. You have a new administration that comes in. They have some great ideas uh, that could help all farmers and even maybe even black farmers and farmers of color. It takes them a year or two uh, to get those ideas into the administration. And by the third year, uh, those persons uh, who are political, who are career bureaucrats there who are supposed to be implementing this say, well, you know what? I, I, I don't like this and I'm going to slow roll this and I, I'm, I'm going to do this the way I've been doing it for 30 years at USDA. Those career bureaucrats always seem to outlast the great ideas. And that's what's been happening to, to Black farmers. We got to find a way around that uh, circus and circle uh, to really uh, put some, some real hard programs into effect so that farmers of color can uh, start receiving some benefits and new and beginning farmers can receive some incentives 
to actually become farmers, people. It's the hardest occupation known to man. And if we don't do some things to do that, to entice and uh, as my son said, daddy, make farming sexy. If we don't find a way to do this in a hurry, we're going to lose a generation of, of, of farmers. What avenues do you see in the next farm bill for increasing climate resilience among all farmers, black farmers, indigenous, white farmers? Climate is a very big issue here. Uh, I think it's a, uh, I think it's an issue that should have been addressed 25 years ago, <laughs> but we're just now getting to it. It's just now front and center. When I was first started farming in 1983, we were planting corn in March. Now I'm planting corn in May, and it's all due to the changing seasons. Uh, when I first started farming, I would be finished uh, harvesting soybeans by October 15th. Now I'm just getting in the field at November uh, because it starts to rain and then I can't get out there. The seasons are changing. Uh, planting season is shorter and the harvest season is shorter. All of those things are due to climate change, the severe summers, uh, maximum heat, you know. When I was a kid, you didn't see 100, 110, 111 degree uh, uh, days when I was a kid. You know, if it got up to 100, man, we, we thought all hell was breaking loose, you know? So now you see uh, triple digits, and it's almost like, oh, it's going to be 100 again today. Uh, crops can stand two days of 100, 100 degree heat, and then you have to do something. Uh, you're going to have to irrigate, or you begin to lose, uh, take uh, damage in your crops. But I'm saying that because climate is changing. We need to address it. We need to help fix it. And it's not just a, a farmer thing. It's, it's a world thing where the whole world is going to have to uh, participate in order to make our climate better. Uh, it's something that we can't continue to take for granted, people. My grandfather said, if you don't take care of the land, the land won't take care of you. John Boyd Jr. is president of the National Black Farmers Association. John Boyd, thank you for sharing your story and your insights on the Farm Bill on Climate One. Thank you very much for having me. On this Climate One, we've been talking about the equity and climate implications of the upcoming Farm Bill. This episode is supported in part by Bank of the West. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. To hear more, subscribe to our podcast on Apple or wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be difficult, awkward, sometimes depressing. And it's critical to address the transitions we need to make in all parts of society and our lives. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review if you're listening on Apple. You can do it right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. By sharing, you can help people move up the ladder of understanding and inquiry and have their own deeper climate conversations. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our producers and audio editors are Aaron Abrocious and Austin Cologne. Megan Basigli is our new production manager. Our team also includes Steve Fox and Sarah Catherine Coxon. Our theme music was composed by George Young. Gloria Duffy is the CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton.